Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our DMUX session. My name is Haisha, and I'm a server software engineer on the Instagram Media Core Infra team. And this is my colleague, Zanzu, and he's on an uh, Android video playback for our Instagram app. So today, we're going to talk about how we transcode users' Instagram videos in VP9 and deliver them for playback on Android devices. So first of all, I'm going to start with the server side. Uh, at Instagram, we serve over a billion active users who upload hundreds of millions of videos per day. Majority of those videos are still encoded in H.264 format. We're very interested in improving users' uh, experience in watching those videos. And one very effective method to do that is to reduce the, the bandwidth. That's where the VP9 format came into our attention because it is a relatively more modern and efficient codec and it's not encumbered by the various complicated licensing issues. Um, and depending on which study you cite, like various studies claim that VP9 is going to offer 25 to 50 percent of the bitrate advantage over H.264. Now, you have to be careful, look into the study. It usually is studied like 1080p, 4K, higher bitrate. Um, Instagram user usually uploads 720p or lower bit rate, so we have to do our own experiment. We're happy to say that for UGC, um, the average bit rate saving is about 20% on a BD rate scale. Um, so this all looks pretty great. Let's uh, just roll it out. What is preventing us from encoding everybody's video on VP9? Well, it turns out this is not a trivial exercise at Instagram scale. I'll talk about two major problems we encountered on the server side. Number one is the rate control. Remember I talked about 20% BD rate savings? That's not a full story because we are not delivering a continuous rate distortion curve to the user. We're doing ABR. We can only select a few encodings at very specific bit rate. That means we better make sure that every VP9 encoding actually saves bit rate compared to the H.264 counterpart. That's when initially we try to do constant quality, aka CRF mode. It doesn't work for us at all because libvpx uses a completely different definition of CRF. There's no one-to-one -one mapping with X264. That led us to two-pass target bit rate. That turns out to work great. It makes sure that VP9's bit rate is consistently lower than H264. However, there is a little caveat Majority of the VP9 encodings are better or neutral quality. There's going to be some corner cases, like a few percent edge cases, that they are actually worse. Um, we don't want to dig into the reasons. We simply filter those out, make sure those VP9 encodings never go to the users. So we solve that problem. The second problem is capacity or computational complexity. So VP9 turns out to be way more demanding our server to do software transcoding. On average, we observe around six times higher CPU usage. So that means we are not going to afford to transcode everybody's video with VP9. We have to do this on a cost versus uh, benefit analysis. Like my own cat video with only 20 watches or likes over its lifetime, it's not going to be worthwhile to transcode it to VP9. Obviously, we're going to look at the most popular accounts the most popular content that's going to generate millions of views, that's where it magnifies the bitrate savings. And that's also how we prioritize our server resources to transcode video to VP9. Having talked about that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Zen, who's going to talk about Android playback. Thanks, Hasha. So saving 20% of your bitrate is a lot, however, our initial test results were not so good. So initially, we tested the system decoder through media codec. And we saw lower PSR, which means less videos were started successfully. Later, we tested the in-app VP9 software decoder. And we saw slightly better PSR. However, we also saw less watch time on low-end phones. So why did we get this result? So it's actually the uh, Android fragmentation problem again. 
So, for example, we have some devices. They may have hardware decoder, but uh, it can work poorly. And uh, we have some other devices. They may have software decoder, <laughs> but uh, they can be too slow to run. And let's look at the system decoder first. So about 30 to 30% uh, to 40% 40 of your devices support a hardware decoder. We can query this through the API, but since it's OEM specific coder, it may or may not work. And uh, Android devices uh, for version 4.4 and above, uh, they have the built-in soft software decoder included, but uh, they can be many different uh, older versions. Uh, we also uh, integrated the latest VPX labor into the app. So since the latest uh, software version, uh, it can be faster than the older versions. And uh, since it's also, uh, since it's a single version of software, we don't have to deal with many different uh, uh, older versions. And this also allows us to customize the decoder for better performance. And now to play a video uh, in Instagram app, we need to decide uh, uh, which decoder to use. Uh, it can be the in-app VP9 software decoder or through the media codec, we have VP9 hardware decoder or fall back to the H264 hardware decoder. So to help us better make a delivery decision, uh, we developed a device capability framework. For example, to decide if a device is fast enough to play uh, VP9 software decoder, first uh, we run decoder speed test on the devices. And we send the result back to the server, and then on the back end, we aggregate the data by model and uh, uh, OS versions. So now for devices with high confidence value, we deliver VP9. Otherwise, we fall back to H.264. We, in order to improve the uh, VP9 playback uh, um, coverage, we also worked on improving the uh, software decoder performance. We run uh, performance profiling on the devices, and also we break down the decoder time uh, per frame uh, across the decoder pipeline. As you can see, this is the VPX decoding pipeline. So, uh, yeah, as you can see uh, the YOV to RGB converging is about uh, 50%. And then we can see the motion compensation is about 25%. And then the deblocking filter is about 15%. And the in, uh, entropy decoder is about 5%. Since the YOV to RGB conversion is the slowest portion, we worked on converting the uh, uh, CPU-based converter to RGU-based, uh, 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 GPU-based. So, since uh, GPU is a lot, uh, a lot faster in doing this kind of computation, and also uh, it can run in parallel with the CPU, uh, this can reduce the time almost to zero on this portion. So now with uh, faster YOV to RGB converter, and uh, uh, we can uh, reduce the decoder time from 40 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds. Uh, this is like a per frame uh, decoder time so on low-end Android phones. So together with better delivery decision, uh, we were able to get most of the metrics improved. And we will continue to look into other methodologies to further improve the decoder performance. Thank you very much for your attention.